Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast. On this show, we talk with veterans, community leaders, Christians, and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey, folks. Today, Matt Bazakis is back for the final episode in our four-part series where we are discussing his dissertation on Romans 13. The finale of this series, we are going to talk about chapter 5 of Matt's paper titled Lamb and Beast, the Conflict Text, Revelation 13. Let's go. Yeah. Left, right, left, right, left. We got our marching right, orders, man. Left, right, left, right. We'd rather left, serve God than right, serve Caesar, you left, know me? Right, I'm just trying to live what he said. I'm just trying Matt Bazakis, how are you doing, my friend? Hey, how are you? Thanks for having me back on. Yeah, <laughs> I know you're not tired of doing this, but I would ask you anyway, are you tired of doing this? We're going to wrap this this series up today, but I, I really appreciate your your flexibility and schedule with me. We're doing some of these or all these episodes before I go to work. Hey, it's all good. And uh, happy birthday. I appreciate that. Yeah, today at the time of this recording is my birthday. So I'm doing a podcast that I'm going to run to work for my birthday. That's, that's, <laughs> that's how my birthday looks. Well, thanks for spending it with me. Yeah, for sure. Well, I did tell them at work last night before I left, I, I demanded a pizza party for tonight. And I doubt I get one, but I was, we were clocking out to go home from work. And I was like, I want a pizza party tomorrow for my birthday. Yeah. And they're like, we got you. But I don't think I'm going to see any pizza tonight. So we'll see. <laughs> I'll keep you all posted. Sounds good. All right. So, um, this part of your dissertation is very interesting to me because you know this about me and many people, and if not everybody that's listened to this show, that I used to be heavily involved with that dispensationalist type movement. And so reading Revelation was always something. I read Revelation continuously back in the day. It just felt like I had it all figured out where this is a future event. We're seeing the Antichrist come in and what we're going to see. And you're, if I think if I'd have read your, your dissertation then, and got to this point, I might have been a little angry with you because I felt like you'd got it all wrong and what you were putting down in there. But now reading it with with the way I look at it now, it's I told you before we started recording, I stopped reading Revelation when I stopped believing in, in the dispensationalist like thinking. So I think maybe I made a mistake because I think Revelation is still an important book of the Bible that we should keep studying. Because in your dissertation, you you view what you what you're calling like it's like a paradigm or, or a model for all empires, not just the Roman Empire, but even past and future uh, empires that's going to come about, too. And I think that was very interesting, too. But I think we'll just start at the beginning with this. And first, how are you doing? Me? Yeah. I'm good. Good. Um, I'm recording right now in my office in Indiana at uh, the church that I moved down to. So I'm, I'm here for the week. Yeah, I know you've been talking about moving. I'm glad that that's all come together well for you. So I'm, I'm proud of you guys and I'm, I'm happy that that you're happy that this looks like this is a good move for y'all. Yeah, we're, we're really excited about it. And uh, yeah, the, this church is fantastic. We just love the people here, um, love just the vision of it. And um, yeah, it, it's uh, it's just exciting to be uh, part of a community like this. From, from what you've told me about your new pastor, it sounds like he's really got the mindset of a no king but Christ type uh Mindset. Very much. And I, I, I look forward to be able to hear some of his sermons and maybe connect with him at some point. Yeah, in October, he's doing a series called I Pledge Allegiance, which is kind of, uh, it's a No King But Christ whole series right before voting. <laughs> so That'll be great. So, yeah. yeah, I'll look forward yeah. to hearing that one. If, is, is, is this going to be available online? Or, or? Yep. Um, so the church is called The Point in Seymour, Indiana. Okay, cool. Yeah, just keep me posted on that because I want to check that out. Yeah, that'll be a good perfect time right before uh, everybody rushes to the poll to, to put their new savior in office. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's get into the uh, the last part of your, your dissertation. Um, I think maybe we should start here with the with just the, the dating of when this was written. Like you said, you it, before we started recording, you didn't think it really matters, but I mean, you kind of brought it up in the dissertation. So maybe we could talk there. You could kind of explain that to where, because there, there seems to be two different schools of thought on this. Yeah. Um, and actually, when it comes to Revelation, there are kind of four main, I guess, main interpretive views. And some people cross cross lines and kind of combine stuff. And I kind of do that a little bit too. Um, so you, you have your dispensationalists, like you were, you were talking about who see all of this as future. The, the entire book they see is something that's unfulfilled, something out there in the future. Um, so that would be a, a, basically a futurist view 
uh, Revelation. Uh, you have those who are called preterist, which is basically a fancy Latin word that means past. So that this all took place and was all fulfilled. And some some vary on whether the last few chapters, the new heavens and the new earth, were fulfilled or not. Um, I don't think they are, obviously. But there's some who are called full preterists that be like, everything's fulfilled and we're in the new heavens and new earth. I'm like, it doesn't really look like the new heavens and the new earth. <laughs> you ask me, but um, yeah, so that's, that's one view of, of preterism. I, I would take a partial preterist view that the primary, um, the primary um, purpose of this letter was written to an audience in John's time. And a lot of these preterists believe that um, this was about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And some take that view of Revelation, um, that it was about that. Then you have historicists, which uh, was kind of the main view in the Reformation, which sees this as something playing out, a timeline playing out throughout all of history. Um, Then you have what's called the idealist view, um, which takes these as spiritual truths, um, paradigms that can happen throughout all of history, kind of like what you were talking about earlier. And that's mainly the view that I take. Um, but I also take kind of the preterist view that I see this as written to a historical community, these seven churches at the beginning. I mean, that's the audience. I mean, it says it straight out at the beginning that John's writing to these seven churches that are in Asia Minor, uh, Turkey. And so I, I title it, um, I take Eugene Boring. He's a scholar, a Revelation scholar, and he calls this the his view, which I take very uh, it's very similar to that it's called the contemporary historical view so um it's to the contemporary audience of john's time in the first century whether that be um a lot of preterists have to hold their date before 70 ad before the temple was destroyed um and then other views say it doesn't uh, it's much later um like in the 90s um 90 ad and so i don't think it really necessarily matters. Uh, like, I think that John could be reflecting either back on the destruction of the temple, because there's a lot of things that are reminiscent of that. Or he could be predicting certain actions around the destruction of the temple. But either way, I think that really the the message is that there is no king but Jesus, and that um, whether it's mainly about the Jews or about Rome, I mean, look at like when Jesus was on on trial, and they say, we have no king but Caesar. And the destruction of the temple was actually probably the judgment for rejecting their king. So you could have revelation about that because they got in bed with the empire. And there's so many allusions to um, basically the the beast or the the woman or all these different things, images in Revelation um, being about Rome. Um, and so that's really what um, what I see the 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 bad guy in the book of Revelation is first century Rome, whether that be under Nero as Caesar or under Domitian as Caesar. Um, I think it's a paradigm, no matter what age you live in or what empire you live under, to see um, these empires as beasts, to see them as controlled by the dragon, to um, obey the call that John says that the angel said in Revelation has come out of her so you don't participate in her plagues. I want to get to Babylon, but there's this portion that says the Deuteronomy 32 worldview in Revelation. I maybe go over that because we that's how we started this series was was with Deuteronomy 32. Oh, yeah. You've talked about it throughout the series. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, you bring it back into Revelation, how the worldview of Deuteronomy 32 is in Revelation as well. And then we'll get to Babylon. I think Babylon is such an interesting, interesting topic because to me, you could see it in today in America. Yeah, it's not just the empire of Rome; it's the empire of America. It's any empire along throughout history. That's the way I kind of look at. I'm no, obviously no scholar on Revelation, but that's kind of how I look at it now. That this could be something that could be past, present, and future events when it, when it depends on the empire. Yeah. So I don't know what that what that makes me a preterist or what that what that makes me. I don't know what that makes me. It just makes me maybe it just makes me confused. Yeah. I don't know <laughs> because it's a very confusing book if you read it. For on its face, I mean, if you read some of these the dispensationalist type books, the way they were describing what John was imaging, maybe he was seeing a helicopter, and, yeah, you know, with stuff like that, all that garbage. But I don't want to get too far. Make the show about dispensationalism at all. But let's go back to the Deuteronomy thirty two worldview and Revelation. Yeah. So I know we have listeners that still believe in dispensationalism. I know we have listeners that are on the fence about. It. I know some people that we passed it too. So mm-hmm. people that they're going to share this with, they need to understand who, what Babylon is about. That it is the United States of America government as well. 
Yep. The entanglement. But anyway, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. So let's, let's start talking about Deuteronomy 32 real quick. Yeah. Um, so if we go back to kind of the first episode of our series, we talked about the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. We're in Deuteronomy 32 verses 8 and 9. It talks about um, how the nations were disinherited um, and put under less, lesser Elohim, you could call them, lesser, lesser, lesser gods, uh, spiritual beings. Um, and there was a covenant people uh, through Abraham that was called to live uh, with Yahweh as, as their king. And this is kind of essential to understanding uh, the framework that's going on in Revelation, because you have these churches and you have this kingdom of priests uh, and 144,000, which is reflected of all those who follow the Lamb. Um, and then you have these people that are following the beast. Um Throughout a revelation, these people are called those who dwell on the earth versus those who dwell with the lamb or those who walk with the lamb. So there's this distinction of two groups uh, throughout all of revelation of the people who who belong to the lamb, people who are following the lamb, which is Jesus. Um, and then there's the people who are either bearing the mark of the beast, the people that are dwelling below that it calls it, the people who are, yeah, there, there's, there's just so many different allusions to um, a separation of, of two groups in in Revelation. And that's throughout the entire Hebrew Bible. There was God's community that lived amongst the nations, in the midst of the nations. And then there's those who were ruled um, by the principalities and powers. All right. So let's go to Babylon. There's there's quite a bit on Babylon in, in your dissertation. So oh, yeah. let's start there because there's there's some I want to I want to get to as you, as you go through this, that I found very interesting. I think it's part of page 270 of your dissertation, when it talks about in Revelation, God says to come out of her by people, which is an overtly sexual reference, when connected to the whore of Babylon and the adultery of God's people who entangle themselves with her. That's pretty, that's, that's kind of in your face <laughs> right there. And, and so I really want to kind of bring that up, you know, but before we get to that, let's start at the beginning of this about Babylon. Yeah, so um, I think, Revelation 17 and 18 um, is really all about Rome, I believe, in the first century. In Revelation um, 17, it calls it this great city, which is on seven hills. And Rome was built on seven hills. Um, a first century person really would have been equated with this. And it connects it to a woman sitting on seven hills, which is the goddess Roma, which was basically the embodiment of the patriotism of Rome. It was also she was on these Roman coins. Um, and early interpreters during this time uh, who wrote from either a Christian or Jewish perspective uh, often um, called uh, Rome Babylon. Uh, we have this in the Sibylline Oracles. That was one it's, it talks about there where, um, where Babylon uh, itself, in, and it says it's in the land of Italy, <laughs> uh, Basically, the they are ones who rebelled against God. And then you also have in what's called Fourth Ezra. Uh, it identifies the Roman Empire as Babylon there as well. You also have in the 15th chapter of Fourth Ezra, again, it talks about um, Asia, which is the area John is writing to, being um, connected and um, sharing in the glamour of Babylon. And then it calls Babylon a miserable wretch. And that it's a harlot, um, and that it glories in its lovers, and it, and it, it people lust after it, after its power. Not a, not a whole lot of uh, nice things to say about Babylon here. No, no. <laughs> not only that, but the early church. Uh, you have Tertullian, you um, who four different times calls Rome Babylon and a prostitute. Uh, you have Hippolytus who does the same thing. You have. Uh, uh, Victorianus, um, another early church father, they're all identifying the Roman state as in connection with, with Babylon. And Babylon was the ones who took Israel into, into exile in the intertestamental period or in the later prophet period. Um, and so it's putting the church kind of in the shoes of what Israel was and telling them to take on that same mindset. And we talked about this in our first Peter uh, video when we talked about living as an exile and revelation as the same theology there as Peter is that the church is supposed to live not as citizens of Rome, but as citizens of heaven, they're citizens of the lamb. 
not citizens of the beast. Let me back up real quick. So when it says the whore of Babylon, mm-hmm. and we're recognized, they're recognized Rome as Babylon. Who's the whore of Babylon? I think that they're recognizing the whore of Babylon as uh, the goddess Roma. Okay. Which was kind of the, it was the embodiment of everything that Rome was. Because it wasn't, they weren't called the churches of Asia Minor, the whore of Babylon. No, they're calling the, because they're entangled with, this goddess Roma, who represents everything that Rome is all about, and they're entangled with it. Basically, they they call it a whore because they're prostituting themselves to Rome. Okay. By their worship of Rome, by their by their allegiance to Rome, by their forsaking of their true kingdom. Okay, so that we'll see that the reason I asked that is what you just said there too, because when we see this in, in modern times with the with the the church entanglement with the state, I could see them being a, adulterous to the whore of Babylon or to Babylon. Yeah. They're cheating on God in a way mm-hmm. with their with their entanglement with the state. Yeah. And the ways that Revelation 17 and 18 identifies Babylon, her characteristics, uh, Scott McKnight, who wrote an awesome book called um, on Revelation called Revelation for the Rest of Us, he identifies these seven characteristics uh, about what Revelation 13, uh, 17 and 18 says um, about the identity of Babylon, which says that he points out that they're anti-God, um, that they're opulent, so they just chase after riches and are flashy, I guess, with a, uh, flashing their riches be- before the world. They're murderous. They're focused on their own image, so puffed up with pride, basically. Um, they're militaristic. Uh, They're economically exploitive, and they are arrogant. They think they're better than everybody else in the world. And he provided uh, verses in Revelation for each one of these examples. Yeah, for each one of those. Yep. Yep. So, and that's, they're all found, those, all those images are found in uh, Revelation 17 and 18. I think this is also a paradigm of any empire that, um, that falls under those, those things. We can probably label them as a modern day Babylon. <laughs> Sounds a lot like America. <laughs> I see America all through it. You know, like going back to how I used to read Revelation, the way I was seeing America in the Bible, I was seeing America as a savior of Israel. You know, and that's how I was viewed America in the Bible. And I could be, you, you could ask people that believe that too. They could point to you, yeah, this is America in the Bible. And I, I don't remember the specific verses they were using now because I'm so far gone from that. But reading reading this and understanding what it actually is talking about, you can see it in America today. Not in just today, man. America's been what not America is not a very old country by by most country standards, you know. And they, but it seems like almost from the very outset of the the founding of this country, it's been that way. And the reason that a lot of people sometimes go dispensational and put this as and dispensational put that all this is written for like the last empire on earth. So that they don't have to see that this means modern day America. So it makes it easy for them saying, oh, well, we can we can interpret Romans 13 and First Peter 2 the way we want to. And we can just ignore this revelation stuff because it's about an empire that doesn't exist yet. It's just a bad empire at the end of history. Yeah. <laughs> you know, instead of like this would make absolutely no sense to any of the readers who John wrote it to. He wrote it to seven literal churches in Asia Minor. It would make absolutely no sense to them if this didn't have like context for them in the first century. Um, I love what John Walton says, and I think I mentioned this in the last episode, that the Bible wasn't written to us, it was written for us. It was written to somebody, but it wasn't written to us. Right. There was an actual audience in the first century that this was written to, and they would have understood it. Right. So if this is about Apache helicopters and <laughs> some Antichrist and stuff like that at the end of the world, it would have meant nothing to John's right. original audience. <laughs> it's so funny just to hear you talk like, say that, because I'm telling you, man, that was so deep into this. I thought that's all I did when it was, was to read the Bible. I went straight to like end time revelation type stuff. And I had a pastor, a, a pastor that preached on it all the time. So I was just so, in, it, I just, I, that's all I wanted to talk about. I, I watched all the stupid movies. I did all that stuff and ran around thinking everybody's going to hell. They didn't believe the, in the rapture and all that other good stuff. And the rapture is less than 200 years old. <laughs> No one in the early church believed it. That would have been very confusing to them, huh? Yeah. And I mean, this is the way that they interpreted yeah. Revelation, was seeing it continually as a paradigm 
of how the church is supposed to live within the empires of the world. So you you finish up there with the the, the description of the of Babylon. I mean, you talked about the whole thing when um, God says to come out of her, my people, which is come out of Babylon, which you mentioned is a sexual reference when it talks about the horror of Babylon, the adultery of God's people, which entangles them with the empires of this world. And it's actually an echo of uh, Abraham when God calls Abraham out of Ur, which is Babylon, in Genesis chapter 12. And so it's an echo of that saying, hey, come come out of this and 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 be my people. And that that ties into the Deuteronomy 32 worldview because at the, this time, Abraham... The story of Abraham comes directly after the Tower of Babel, where the nations were divided up. So he's saying, come out from under these, these powers and be my separate people. Just that, that, that portion right there, which is an overtly sexual reference, you know, would connect to the Horde of Babylon. Because I don't think, actually, I know that the vast majority of Christians today who are entangled with the state and still do their state worship through the church and stuff, they don't understand that they are being a, adulterous to to. I mean, to Christ. I mean, I mean, if, if 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 we're the bride of Christ and you're entangling yourself with another empire, with another kingdom, you're being adulterous to Jesus. Yeah. You're cheating on Jesus, and in, in, in a sense, well, I don't even think in a sense it's exactly what's going on when you when you're entangling yourself with the state. Yeah, and in the beginning of Revelation, it says that we are a kingdom of priests to Christ, purchased by His blood. Yeah, <laughs> that He bought us. <laughs> you know, um, and then throughout the whole rest of Revelation, like I talked about, it, it says that. In Revelation 1, 6, he has made us to be a kingdom and priests. In Revelation 1, 9, it says that that we're that John is a partaker in the tribulation and in the kingdom. And then it's Revelation 5, 10, it says he's made us to be a kingdom and priests to our God. And then Revelation 11, 5, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and he will reign forever and ever. Um, Revelation twelve ten it says, um, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of Christ have come for the accuser of the brethren, which is Satan, has been thrown down. There's a, definitely a big contrast in Revelation there. And, and then there's also in Revelation 16, the beast has a kingdom there. It says, then the angel poured out the fifth bull on the throne. Um, the th- he poured out on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened. Revelation 17 says, Ten horns, which you saw, are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they will receive authority of kings with the beast for one hour. In Revelation 17, it talks about that um, God will execute his purpose by having a common purpose, giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God may be fulfilled. That's Revelation 17. 17. So like there's this contrast in kingdoms. There's the people of God. There's um, there's the people who follow the lamb wherever he goes. And then there's people who are part of the beast's kingdom. And that's kind of this, I guess, dichotomy, This these two sides in Revelation. Okay. So do you want to let's go skip down to Revelation 14? What it says, one of the ultimate images for discipleship and for the people of the lamb is found in Revelation 14, 1 through 5. Oh, yeah, the, the 144,000. Yeah, because I remember reading this this portion about the 144,000. I never understood it, trying to fit it into my dispensationalist type thinking. Yeah. I was like, what does this mean? What is the, but, but the way you laid it out, I was like, oh, because even then, I like, you have Jehovah's Witnesses that will use that as their... There's only going to be 144,000 going to heaven or something. If I get their their understanding of the Bible correct, I don't I don't know if I got that yeah. right or not. Yeah. yeah. So so we have so actually 144,000. They show up first in Revelation chapter seven, verses four through eight, where there's kind of this census of all these tribes of Israel. And what we see there is there's a thing that happens throughout Revelation, an interpretive thing we need to notice. John will often hear things. And then what he sees is the interpretation of what he hears. So, for example, in, in um, Revelation 4 and 5, we see a, um, we hear the line of Judah. But when John looks and sees, he sees a lamb that was slain. So, it's really easy to follow, follow a, uh, a huge lion, a roaring lion, right? A, a king that's like a lion. But what about a king that's like a lamb? right. So it's like this backwards image. So what we have um, is a military census, basically, in Revelation chapter 7 of 144,000 Israelites. 
And John hears the census. He never sees the 144,000. But what he hears is every tribe, tongue, and nation worshiping around the throne. So it's all those who follow the lamb are, um, it's an image that just depicts all those who, who follow the lamb and worship him. Revelation 14, one through five, the 144,000 show back up and they're the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. I want to, I want to get into this too, because it says that they have not defiled themselves with women. And in parentheses, Rome slash Babylon. So I, I think that that's kind of what it means. The woman throughout the rest of Revelation is usually depicted of something connected to Babylon. So they haven't filed themselves with Babylon. Now, let me ask you this. Like, and I don't know if you can answer this or not, but so you got the 144,000, everybody that has not defiled themselves with, with the state or with Rome or Babylon or the American Empire, whoever, is there a way back? into the kingdom of God. You know what I'm saying? If you're, do you know where I'm going with this? Like if, if these are the ones following him around or if it's just ever, I don't know how to explain this to myself. I guess is why I'm asking it because we've all done it. We all participated in some kind of state worship at some point. You know, you know what I'm saying here? Well, I think it's, yeah, it's symbolic of those who have been washed clean by Christ and have followed followed the Lamb wherever he goes. Right, um, and it's not just a literal 144,000 people like the Jehovah Witnesses talk about. It, it's symbolic. Pretty much every number in Revelation is symbolic. It means it means something. Like num- numbers mean things in in Jewish theology. Um, and so, yeah, when people look try to get too overly literal, instead of seeing that apocalyptic literature, which this is an apocalyptic book, and it was a style of writing that we don't have anymore, but it was a popular style of writing during this time. And there's many apocalypses out there that are written very similar to Revelation in this style. And um, and it, nobody expected you to interpret it literalistically. Like literally, those symbols mean something, <laughs> but it doesn't literally mean there's 144,000 people that are going to be this... <laughs> Uh, army of virgins, basically. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I like that because, it, like I said, it, they, yeah, the symbolism is there, and it, it can be taken one way or the other too. Like it has been through, like you said, the rapture is two hundred years old, and you see all this stuff. It's not, it's, it's a symbol, but it's been misinterpreted. Anyway, again, I keep going back to that because it's in the back of my head the whole time I was reading this. Because, like I said, I spent so much time on that. Mm-hmm. many, many years ago. All right, let's move on. And, and in my first chapter of my dissertation, I kind of go through all these different ways of interpreting Revelation. I've kind of gotten to a little bit today, but if people read the first chapter, I go way, way more in depth of why I've landed in this interpretive method and why I think it's faithful to the text of Scripture. So people can, if they want, I, I can email them a copy of my dissertation or whatever, and they can read more in depth in my first chapter where I kind of dig into this a little more to establish my, basically my, my interpretive process. Hey folks, do you like salsa? I love salsa. I have come up with a fire recipe and we have been shipping this homemade salsa all across the country. If you like salsa and want a cool way to support the project and spread the message of no key but Christ, then holler at us. You can reach us at badrobersalsa at gmail.com or visit the official Bad Roman Salsa Facebook page and message us there. Thank y'all so much for your continued support. Now let's get back to the show. All right, should we just jump into Revelation 13 then? We've done a lot of setup. So in the first 10 verses, there's a whole lot of different things uh, going on here. So I'll just read that. Um, It says this, And the dragon stood on the sands of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up from the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems, and on his head were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth was like a lion. And the dragon gave him power and his throne and great authority. I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshiped the dragon because he gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast and who is able to wage war with him? There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act. 42 months was given to him and he opened his mouth with blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and those that dwell in heaven. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. 
All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Every one whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the Lamb's book of life who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, the captivity he will go. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. So right off, like we've got a dragon and a beast from the sea. And Revelation 12, if you go back a chapter, kind of depicts this cosmic conflict between the dragon and God's people, kind of begins to set it up there. And I think it's uh, it's kind of a symbolic retelling of the of the nativity of uh, Jesus's incarnation of his birth. I think it kind of mixes together some images of like uh, Leviathan, who is uh, this chaos monster, uh, I guess you could say, in in Jewish thought and the account that we talked about in Genesis six of the sons of God. And I think he's also pulling in some Roman myth. It's called the Python Lido myth. Um, it was a tale about Apollo, um, how he killed a snake who was stalking his mother, just like this dragon. This snake was stalking um, the woman who give, gave birth to Jesus, which is symbolic of Mary, but then also um, God's people. It kind of changes into there. And it was this story, this py, uh, Python Lido myth was used as imperial propaganda to portray the emperor as Apollo and uh the sons of God with him who defeated the chaos monster. Um, and so John is taking this image that would have been a popular story to show that Jesus is the true one who defeats Satan instead of Satan's ruler, the one who defeats his enemies. So he's just kind of right up at front there doing that, I believe. All the imagery there, and I apologize, listeners, because I, and I've told myself I'm not going to get into the dispensationalist type of but I keep reverting back to it because it's so, it was so, I, spent, in you, yeah. Yeah, I spent so much time on it. And so when I read this, I read the imagery, I keep going back to what I taught myself and what I was taught by other people when it comes to this and just reading this now, how you put all this through there, because you kind of explain exactly what all this imagery means. Yeah. So we, we get into, we see the dragon, it's giving authority to the beasts or the and there's two beasts here. And a lot of dispensationalists will just say, oh, the beast as singular beast. I'm like, no, there's two beasts going on here. Later, kind of that second beast. Um, so you got a beast from the sea, a beast from the land. And um, one is eventually called the false prophet because it props up the first beast. Yeah. So let's kind of get into that. And it talks about all these different images like that it that it has. Um, and if you go and you you look at Daniel chapter seven, you see all these different beasts there as well in Daniel chapter seven, which represent every one of those represents an empire, right? <laughs> like in Daniel chapter seven. And so it's, this is kind of a mashup of all those ancient empires all into one big, bad empire under the dragon. And while a lot of people will say, Oh, well the, the beast is a person, this end times antichrist, but John's interpretation of the beast. If you echo back to Daniel chapter seven is, the beast is an empire. The beast is empire incarnate, basically yeah. the spirit of empire, which is controlled by the dragon, which we find out in Revelation that is Satan. <laughs> right? Which we do that back from Jesus's temptation. From when you go all the way back to that. I mean, yeah, he's Satan was the one who offered him the kings of the world. Um, and now the sea was also um, has images of the Old Testament where the sea represented chaos and evil. And so that was uh, the beast is coming out of the sea. <laughs> so coming from chaos and evil. <laughs> OK, makes sense. Yeah. I mean, even in Genesis one, you have the spirit of God hovering over the chaotic waters and bringing order out of chaos. There's some other connections here um, with Daniel seven, uh, the blasphemous names that we talked about that, that it that it said um, and that the lion, the bear, the leopard and the terrifying beast um, all connect to Daniel seven. So he's saying that this is kind of the combination of all those stuff. And John interprets that this power and the authority that it's getting comes from the dragon. But not only that, but the dragon also gives the beast a throne. Right. So the beast, in some ways, is a person, but it's also an empire. But with Satan pulling the strings behind the scene, what we see here. And that, and that totally like follows and reflects that Deuteronomy 32 worldview that we talked about 
throughout this entire thing. And I stress this over and over and over during these shows that we've been doing for so for four years now. And if you cannot look at Empire today and see how Empire behaves, it says looks nothing like the teachings of Christ. It looks everything like the teachings of, of the evil one, the Satan. Yeah, so, exactly. I mean, it, 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 we and the Christians should be the first ones to recognize that. And I'm talking, I, mean, I, I know we've, we've, we've got our small circles that we run in that a lot of us do recognize it, but the vast majority of Christians are just failing to recognize this. And they, they, they get so stuck with this. It grinds my gears. All right. The fatal, the fatal wound hill. This is, this is a fun one for me. Okay. Because this is this part right here. This is where I was like all about the antichrist. And this is where. And somebody shoots him and he gets healed. And he gets healed <laughs> and he comes back to life. And people life. marvel after him. <laughs> yep. I believed all that stuff, man. Yeah. Um, so um, Nero committed suicide June 9th of AD 68. Um, and there were two major historical base and political situations at play. First, um, the Julio-Claudine line, emperor line, um, was now ended with Rome being dead because he didn't have a successor. And the second issue is that his suicide basically had a lack of succession, and it threw Rome into a civil war over power. Um, and so if you have all these guys fighting over who's going to be basically the new, the new emperor. And there was like a year where there were multiple emperors. Eventually, it came down to um, Vespasian, who um, was one of the generals uh, taking the throne. What Josephus, who's an ancient writer, said that basically that it was almost like uh, Rome was resurrected at that time. And so there's the civil war. It looks like Rome's going to collapse and fall apart. Vespasian, like it was a year of, uh, they called it the year of the four emperors. So there are these four emperors that all ruled for a little bit of time, a couple months, each of them for a year. And then Vespasian comes on the scene and he pulls the whole empire basically back together. And all these Roman writers and even Jewish writers say that it was as if um, Rome had resurrected from the dead. So what John's saying, and when it's, he's, he's, when he put this stuff down, he's talking about the empire being resurrected, not a human being, not a human because that's yeah. that was another thing that was always taught to us about it was like, well, the Antichrist was like Jesus. He was resurrected, you know, and he was brought back to life. And so, mm -hmm. but what John is talk, actually talking about is just the empire looked dead and it was, it was brought back, was, was revived again to be the empire again. Yeah. And those who take the late date of Revelation will see this as was called um, the Nero Redivivus myth, which is basically they didn't think that Nero died. They think he, they faked his suicide and he went off into the the east to live and that he was coming back again. <laughs> um, and so some people see this as Nero faking suicide and this rumor that was going around, especially in this area by these seven churches, um, that Nero was coming back because these people loved Nero. <laughs> Nero <laughs> thought he was crazy. a god. <laughs> like he was crazy. But the, the Roman citizens loved him. Also, like after this uh, basically resuscitation of the empire, verse three says that they all followed after the beast. This is the same word when it says followed after. It's the same word as, that is used throughout the Bible for discipleship. They became disciples of the beast. Um, we talked a little bit about the arrogant words and blasphemies that came out of the mouth. That, that comes, uh, it's a quotation basically from Daniel chapter seven, verses eight. Both um, Nero and um, Domitian were known for taking the titles, uh, divine titles onto themselves, thinking of themselves as gods um, or incarnates of gods. And, and basically how, how their rule was seen as essentially divine, that they were div divinely ordained, <laughs> I guess you could say, to, and the state was then thus as well because of them. And so I go to, into a bunch of quotes in my dissertation on different things that uh, different Roman poets wrote. And also it, it, ta it talks about the Roman poet uh, Ovid during this time. He, he wrote that the state is Caesar and Caesar is the state. <laughs> so to worship Caesar is to worship the state. To worship the state is to worship Caesar. And I think that's missed a lot, too. I mean, he's not wrong. No, he isn't. And so many of these Caesars, I've got a bunch of quotes in there, too, um, just blasphemed God by calling themselves God, basically putting themselves in that, that place. 
if you noticed in the text when we read it that there's a distinction between those who followed the beast, I mean, not a distinction, but a, a correlation of those who follow the beast being called those who dwell on earth versus those who dwell in heaven, which is used elsewhere in, um, in Revelation of those who follow the lamb. One of the verses there, when we look, look at the text, it talks about if anyone has an ear, let him hear. Verse 9, when you go back to the Old Testament, when that's usually said, it's because idols don't have eyes or ears. They can't hear, they can't see. And so essentially what John's calling his audience there is that they've been so blinded by their idols and they can't see or hear because they're so wrapped up in their entanglement with idolatry. And then at the end of the section, it talks about captivity and the sword. Um, And this is a verse that's a quotation from Jeremiah 15, verses 3, about being Israel going into captivity and being dragged away by the four beasts, which is very interesting that he he uses that, and, and that they would suffer by the sword because of their sin of idolatry. So really what Jeremiah 43 speaks of the judgment of on Israel's em- enemies for using that same language of captivity, sword, destruction. So there's kind of this double meaning, I think, here combining these texts. Um, so the believers who are entangled with the beast will participate in its destruction, but those not allegiant to the beast will also face captivity and sword due to their resistance. Right. Like, look what happened to Jesus at the hands of Rome, right? He was crucified. He was, he was, he was killed um, for standing up to the empire. But at the same time, God said he's going to judge those who live by the sword, by the sword. Right, right, right. So there's kind of a double meaning to it. Hey, folks, we have set up a very simple way to donate to the Bad Mormon Project through SpotFund.com. Just go to SpotFund and search No King But Christ. This has become necessary to continue to provide a quality podcast and keep production costs down as well. Just five or ten bucks a month will go a long way in helping us keep this project going and continue spreading the very basic message of No King But Christ. So if you like what we were doing and can find it within your budget, go to SpotFund.com and search No King But Christ and you can set up monthly donations or even donate one time. Any and all donations help more than you know And as always, any donations above production costs will go directly to charities in Memphis, Tennessee. Thank y'all so much. Now back to the show. Do you want to get into the mark of the beast? Yeah. Uh, Let's look at verses 11 through 18. We'll read that because that has the mark of the beast and 666 and all that in it. So then we'll talk about that. Uh, So I'll read that. Um, So this is Revelation 13, beginning in verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell on it to worship the beast whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven onto the earth in the presence of men, and he deceives all those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given to perform in the presence of the beast, telling all those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand and on their forehead. And he provided that no one would be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who understands calculate the number of the beast for the number that is of a man, and his number is 666. All right, so uh, first, the, next we have the beast from the earth. So that first one we were talking about is the beast from the sea, which represents Rome and all of its political power, which is received by the dragon. This next section here um, is another beast. It's a beast that looks like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. This basically paints a picture communicating that the second beast is a parody of Jesus, the lamb. But in reality, it actually is more like the dragon. Right. So it deceives. <laughs> this beast has religious ties to the first beast. It promotes the worship of the first beast and the dragon. 
So throughout the rest of Revelation, this beast is also called the false prophet. A true prophet would lead people back into covenant faithfulness with God, but the false prophet, this false beast prophet, leads people to trust the state and to worship the state. Who do you think that's representing? I think it's a system of Roman propaganda. Okay. Like like the media, maybe? Yep. Basically, it could be media. It could be um, basically the Roman Roman prophets, could be politicians, <laughs> uh, it could be any of those things that prop up the worship of the state and the worship of those in power. Well, that could be a church. That could be the media. That <laughs> could be anybody. Okay. Yeah. Be some of these false Christian nationalist prophets yeah. <laughs> out there. They could be participating in that spirit of the second beast. Um, the, let's talk about the number for a second, because yeah, um, what is the what, what does he refer to the six hundred sixty six? He referred to Nero. Is that so? I I think there's a bunch of things that it it could potentially be. Um, So it says first that a mark was given on the right hand of the forehead. Um, That's a kerygma. This is the Greek word. It's an allusion to the practice of branding slaves or branding soldiers um, and religious devotees of certain gods and religions. So it means basically that if you're taking this mark, you belong to your allegiance, you worship the one whose mark you bear. The mark also, it says you're unable to buy and sell. So we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so kerygma was a technical term used for the imperial stamp on documents. And it's also had the image or the icon of the emperor's head on these coins. So basically it, it's marking who you belong to. So let's kind of, I guess, get into kind of that the, the mark first, and then we'll get into the number of, it, of his name. I think that this is kind of like figurative. The the mark is it's it's a parody of basically what it said on your on your forehead and your in your hand, right? What God also says in Deuteronomy that God's people are to bind His law to their hands and to their forehead. And so, what that meant in that context, some Jews have taken this literally. Sometimes you'll see some rabbis with literally like Torah scrolls around their wrists and hanging off their their head in these little boxes. <laughs> but what, what it means is God's commands should be in our head. It should be our thoughts. Yeah. It should be what's on our mind. And having this on our hands meant it's actions. So if we have the mark of God by his word on our hands and our in our head, it means it's the way we think and it's the way we act. If we have the mark of the beast on our heads and on our hand, symbolically it's the way of empire is the way we think and the way we act. And it shows who you truly worship. Okay. I like that. Well, that makes sense. So, yeah. So that, that, that's kind of what, what I, I think of it um, is, is literally that way. So let's look at the number of the beast. The, the mark is both the name of the beast and it's the number of a person. Um, so this was a, a practice in the ancient world um, called gementria where every letter um, in the alphabet had a number related to it because they didn't really have a number system in Greek or Hebrew. They, they would have, so every, every letter basically had a numerical value. So if you spell the name out and you add up what every letter means, it would be that number. And we found this in ancient graffiti of like 514 loves 17. So you could figure out like who loves who based on the number of their name. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so like we have this like an ancient graffiti it was it was a common it was a common thing that that they did even in this uh what's called the sibylline oracles we have jesus represented by 888 when you calculate his name in greek really yeah yeah in pompeii it was uh they had a, a cryptograph on a wall that says i love her whose number is 545 <laughs> <That's> so strange <laughs> so it was like it was like a comic i have an image of somebody climb, climbing up a water tower <laughs> with some, That's right. with some green you heard that song <laughs> yeah, you see that song that john Deere green yeah Painted on a lover on a, on a water tower, basically. Yeah. <laughs> right now, sorry. So, uh, six, so 666 must be the, the number of a person. And what we have, like when we, um, if we take Nero's name, we convert it into Hebrew. The letters would be N-R-W-N-Q-S-R. So that would be Neron Kaiser, translated as Nero Caesar, or Caesar Nero. If you add it all together, it equals 666. So we also have, the, so people will be like, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. 
Um, we have some manuscripts that says 616 is the mark of the beast. And so why is that? So when we translate Nero's name into Latin and then use the same thing, it equals 616. 616, which is in some of these manuscripts. So not all the manuscripts have 666. Some have 616. But it's still either way you translate it. If you translate it to Latin or to Hebrew and do the same process of Gementria, it equals 666. I think people, uh, while John writes in Greek, I think he's thinking in Hebrew. And that's why he translates it into Hebrew for the 666. Well, but, it, but basically what's going on here is, is when it comes to that number, with that, who that person is, he's talking about a, a, something that's happened in that time. Yep. They would understand who he's talking about. Mm-hmm. It's not some future guy in the, in the, in the, in the future, the yeah. future antichrist that, that I used to expect to come about. The no point of revelation is not to me. And I, I think it's just, he was writing to people who would understand what's going on, the context of what's going on, and it could be used to describe current and future empires as well. Mm-hmm. And, and the word beast itself in Greek, its number is 666. Okay. So, I mean. So the beast itself. And that guy's still running around causing trouble. So, I mean, it's. Yeah. Church father, Ir- Irenaeus, um, he showed also how um, the word Latinos, which was Romans, uh, basically another name for those who who are part of the Roman Empire, that equals 666 when you use Gementria. So the Roman Empire. So he does that. And that's what Irenaeus connects to it. But he also says that 666 um, is when the, the word Titans. So which were basically in Roman literature, the Titans were locked up waiting for the day of judgment. Peter uses kind of their image, you know, when we talked about Tartarus and kind of uh, in the the principalities and powers that are locked up for the day of judgment who led humanity astray back in Genesis six and that. So, um, Irenaeus also connects six, six, six to be connected to, uh, the Roman myth of the Titans and connects that back to Genesis chapter six, seeing how they overlap. Well, then you go on to say essentially six, six, six in this context in the old Testament sees it as a connection of getting in bed with power with the powers yeah so 666 the only time the number 666 besides revelation shows up in the bible is with solomon back in first kings chapter 10 and second chronicles chapter 9 where solomon received 666 talents of gold um, besides that from the traders and the merchants and all the kings of the arabs and the governors of the country so essentially what what 666 could mean in a hebrew context if they're connecting back to that is that 666 represents getting in bed with empire. Because according to what was supposed to be done for by kings in the Old Testament, is that they weren't supposed to be amassing all this wealth, amassing all these chariots and war horses. And so that's the number of how much many talents Solomon was given every year, was 666. And that's the only mention of 666 in the Old Testament. And John continues to echo back to the Old Testament and everything connecting his numbers, his images and everything. And they have to be interpreted through what they meant in the Old Testament. That's really kind of a breakdown of 666. Like when, when we when we look at, at what it means, it's kind of a paradigm for quite a lot of things that are empire, you know, quite a lot of things that tie into those who take this mark. Uh, the mark of the beast and the and the one whose mark they take is six six six. They they're putting basically putting themselves in bed with empire. I think that's a, it's it's an important point to 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 make because God I keep going back to this this imagery type stuff. You know, when people try. I, I'm trying so hard not to because I'm. I, it's yeah. I don't. I don't want sensational. Let's talk about let's talk about that just a minute. Um, so a lot of people will take. Like we talked about earlier, modern interpreters often connect like a singular beast to what's called the Antichrist and then connect that here to Revelation 13. Yet the word Antichrist is never used in the book of Revelation. It's not. It's used elsewhere in John's writings. And here's what John says about it. Um, If you look at 1 John 2 verses 18 through 22, it says, uh, this is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Then in 1 John chapter 4, verses two to three, it says that every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. 
and the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and is already in the world. And then after that, 2 John 1, 7 talks about many deceivers have gone into the world, um, those who do not acknowledge that Jesus has come in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the Antichrist. So what we can break down from what the Bible actually tells us about an Antichrist is anyone, right? get that, anyone who denies that Jesus is the Christ. The second is anyone who denies the Father and the Son. And the third one is any spirit that does not confess Jesus as Lord. And with, with the word antichrist, and it's something that me and Doug had talked about too, it's anti-king. It's anti... Yeah, anti-king, yeah. So it, it, it's if he's already he's in the world, he's already in the world, and it, like you said, it's not in the book of Revelation, but it, tying back to like the Dispy type thinking, Nero who committed suicide was the antichrist, it came back to life, but it wasn't Nero, it was the Roman Empire. And it's anything that is... It could direct conflict with the teachings of Christ as an antichrist, which is empire. Empire specifically is is is, is yeah is antichrist. All of them, every single one of them are. It's antichrist. Yeah, <laughs> and we talked about this. Christ means anointed one, and the anointed one was the king. So they're anti king. They're anti our king. <laughs> so, um, so really, if you read Revelation kind of as a book about political discipleship rather than future predictions we can come across with some really like great meanings for even us as moderns who weren't alive in the first century to glean from what John was telling his churches about how to come out of the empire and live as people who follow the lamb. And that's really what this is about. Revelation really like just kind of unveils that Jesus as the lamb is the true ruler of the world and his way of conquering, because that word conquer, um, Nike in Greek, Nikaio, is really the complete opposite the way that Jesus conquers of the way that of power and coercion and the way of empire. Basically, those seven things we talked about, anti-God, opulent, murderous, image focused, militaristic, economically exploitive, arrogant. Right. That's the opposite of Jesus. 100 percent. Well, I think. Maybe we can start wrapping this up if you want to, unless we miss something. And it, now towards the end of, uh, or at the end of your dissertation, you've got an overview of all of it. And I don't, I have not read the overview yet. I wanted to go through the, these first five chapters with you first, and I'll, I'll read it later. I, I don't know if you want to kind of give it over a quick overview instead of doing a, a fifth episode, if, if there's a way you could do a quick overview yeah. of everything, or people could just go read the dissertation and read the overview from there. Yeah, so really kind of the... The purpose of like the whole study was to examine uh, the relationship between church and empire, um, plus the church's response to the principalities and powers. Um, and so I set out really to explore what might seem as contradictory texts when you're looking at this, the submission text of Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2 and the conflict text of Revelation 13 and what I believe that I was able to show is that Babylon exists in all ages and that God's people are called to come out from her. We still live in the midst of empire, but we're not supposed to live in the midst of empire as citizens. We're a separate kingdom. We're separate people. And I believe that is really when you look at the whole, all the New Testament, all the Old Testament, Israel was called to do that in the midst of the nations. We're called to live as exiles in the midst of empire. And that's really I think the point of view as we went through all that, we still see even today, I believe that the Deuteronomy 32 worldview is like these principalities and powers are ruling over the nations of the world, but we're part of a separate nation. And so we saw in the Old Testament that really behind every empire, these principalities and evil powers are pulling the strings. And it's not our job to go take them over. That's Jesus's job. Our job is to follow Jesus, right? We're supposed to live as his already set free people, displaying as lights to the world, his kingdom life within the church. We're not supposed to make America the church. God already has a nation. I'm looking to try to release it all, all four of these as close to the the election as I can. I don't know how if it, how helpful it's going to be for people who are kind of just dug in and not, not wanting to listen to it or not. But I would I want to be able to share it with so much with people there when they're running to the polls. And like you said, where it's not our job to go try to change the empire, or change America. That's Jesus' job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so like both in Romans 13 
And in 1 Peter 2, we see this word submit that doesn't mean obey. And when you read the sections that come right before both these texts, we see a separate way of living laid out. We see that in Romans 12, and we see that at the very beginning of, uh, of 1 Peter chapter 2, that we're set apart, holy nation, priests unto God, um, the basically the Romans 12 way of life, which echoes the Sermon on the Mount. That is the way of life for the church, and we're supposed to live, like I said, in the midst of these nations. First Peter is dealing with people who are are exiles. They're foreigners in their in their homeland because of their baptism into Christ. Um, Romans thirteen is dealing with trouble in the neighborhood that Paul is trying to basically set up. He wants to go on a mission to Spain, and he wants these people, Jews and Gentiles, that have all this division in the church to be one. He's also trying to quell some of this these notions of zealotry, um, you know, f- fight fighting back against powers that are by there. And he's saying, hey, I think he's just trying to deal with a local situation in a neighborhood and not prescribing in Romans 13 uh, an, an ethic of how we relate to all governments at all times relating to a local situation. Revelation 13, we see that it's spelled out that these people are entangled with the empire, these churches, and Paul or John's calling them out of it and showing them how like actually like Rome, the beast of Rome is ruled by the dragon, Satan. So, you know, don't participate in, in all these, in the worship of the beast. Don't take his mark, take the mark of the lamb. And that's kind of where, like, when we compare all these texts, I think they line up when we see that all the nations are ruled by principalities and powers. Um, but Jesus's way is different and he calls us to be part of a different kingdom. And it calls us to, to pledge our allegiance to no king but Christ. And so really, like... The question that it asks us, I think, at the end is beast or lamb? Who are you going to serve? And I think people need to recognize, too, who the beast is. And it could be whether you're listening to this in whatever country you're in, your government is part of that system of the beast. I mean, it's not just America. I mean, America is probably one of the most deadly. I don't know, you know, comparing. I meant to mention this earlier, too, when we're talking about Rome in, in the book of Revelation. I don't know if. America, the American government has been more deadly than, than Rome. I don't know. I don't have numbers in front of me, but I do know that. I don't know. But I do know that they've been able to marshal way more tools than the Roman Empire was mm-hmm. to destroy other people's lives. And like I said earlier, this is this looks nothing like Christ. It looks everything like you would expect Satan to behave. Yep. And as a Christian, you should come out of her. Mm hmm. Come out of her because this it, it's, it's it's far past the point now that we're, we we've got to stop entangling ourselves with this because it makes you look bad. It makes it makes you're doing Jesus a disservice by acting this way, behaving this way. I got to a discussion with somebody about Israel, and I stand with they like they're, they're like I stand with Israel, and I'm like Israel is slaughtering children. They've killed over fourteen thousand children in, in Gaza right now. We're standing with that. I mean, so this is not a defense of Hamas, and I'm going off topic, but I'm getting I'm getting so tired of Christians who are, who say shit like that, and they will not stand up and say, "Hey, on a second, this is wrong," and everything you're doing is getting entangled with the state and getting entangled with the state and, and, and backing this stuff. You're making it worse. Come out of her. I'm, I'm over it, man. I, it frustrates me so much. And the closer we get to election time, the more I see this garbage. Coming out, it, it frustrates me more because I, I want to grab Christians by their shirt, call it regal mother by the neck and say, listen to me. Are you not reading what's going on here? You're not saying, seeing what's going on here. Listen to these conversations I've had with Matt. Everything you're supporting, you're supporting the devil himself. Come out of her. Yep. Sorry. I, I think, no, I think that, <laughs> that, um, that rings for today, and that's the message of Revelation. We believe that, I believe scripture is divinely inspired. So often in our Western society, we think it's written, like I said, to to just me and my time in history and that. And that that's that's our prideful, inflated view of self in America that think it's all about us. <laughs> you know, I mean, yes, in Scripture is written to us. But as we talked about, like Revelation is a paradigm that can be applied to all people at all times. We need to interpret it within what it meant to that first century audience. And I believe that like John is writing about Rome and an empire. And it's a, it's a paradigm of, all right, if you see empires that look like this, then yeah, 
their Babylon. 100%. 100%. I mean, there's like so, some great books on Revelation. If you want to dig more into this point of view and how to read Revelation this way, I would recommend Scott McKnight's um, book, uh, Revelation for the Rest of Us. Um, Michael Gorman's book called Reading Revelation Responsibly. Those two books are are just incredible books on on Revelation. Um, a book called Triumph of the Lamb is really great by Johnson. Yeah, th- those are some of some of the best that I I think uh, I've read. Um, even Preston Sprinkle's new book Exiles gets into a lot of the book of Revelation, and um, Gorman calls it a theopolitical a theopolitical letter, which means it's the theology of the politics of Jesus and how he calls his church to live underneath him as king, underneath his kingdom, and how that should um, inform how we relate to the kingdoms of the world. Perfect, my friend. I appreciate all your time with uh, these four episodes, and I'm sure you'll be back on the show again. I'm sure we'll have more to talk about, but <laughs> I'm going to give you a break, let you take a break for the Bad Roman podcast for a little bit because I've, I've kept you busy over the past month or so. And I appreciate all the hard work that you put into this dissertation. And, and, and once again, why don't you go ahead and tell the listeners where they can get in touch with you if they want to read this themselves? Yeah, um, you can email me, matt at expedition44.com. I'll, I'll send you a copy. I haven't been informed that it's been published yet. I mean, you could probably Google it. Uh, my dissertation was called Principalities, Powers, and Allegiances. Yeah, you can watch uh, Expedition 44 on any on YouTube and any podcast app that you use. Yeah, that's really about it. Awesome, man. Man, I really appreciate your time. And uh, I'm glad everything's working out good for you and your family there in Indiana. Sounds good, man. Thank you for having me on. And it's been awesome talking with you and all those out there listening to The Bad Roman. Yeah. Check out the Bad Roman. I check out the No Keep at Christ Network as well. That, yeah, No Don't Keep, keep, don't keep yeah. at Christ Network.com. It'll be in the show notes as well. All right, buddy, I'm going to let you get out of here. Thanks for joining us this week on the Bad Roman Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts to never miss an episode. And while you're at it, if you like what you heard, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, it really helps people find us. 100% of donations are given to local charities in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn more about The Bad Roman Project and to find show notes, please visit thebadroman.com.